Okay, folks, time to get excited. That's right, I've been watching Dr. Stone, and I'm going to be fixing the covers for ISOM number two. ISOM number two famously has four covers, so let's take a look at them and see what needs fixing on each. First, we're going to look at Turnian's cover D. This is the mass market cover for ISOM number two that's going to be published in perpetuity. You've got uh, Isom hanging off a building there and uh, Shadron's spectral face up in the top portion with a giant ass moon that would offend Neil deGrasse Tyson. I mean, dear God, the moon is never that large in the sky. Can we all just agree that when we look up in the night sky, we never see the moon as more than a dime size? And it's not like you couldn't accomplish the same spectral effect if, say, you shrunk the moon down and put it in Shadron's eye. You would still get the same kind of ghostly effect without violating the laws of astronomy and sending the moon crashing into the Earth. So, so I like to see some amount of realism. I know Todd McFarlane has been jacking with the moon ever since Spawn back, back in 1992, but, you know, come on. Let's, let's keep things reasonable here. All righty, what's next? We got Shane Davis's cover C. This was the famous foil cover that sold for 100 bucks, and there's really not much to say about the cover, except the face kind of looks wrong. I mean, when you compare Shane Davis's look for Avery Sullivan against the uh, Cliff Richards art, you know, the interior art of ISOM number one, you don't get a face that is as thin as Shane Davis's uh, face appears to be for uh, the face of Avery Solman on Shane Davis's cover appears to be. His cheekbones are more prominent in the Shane Davis cover, and his face kind of seems to taper down to more of a rectangular shape. Some of this may be affected by the fact that um, you know, I had to get a picture of the book kind of at an angle, but I don't think that really changes the effect much. Uh, when you look at Avery Solman's head from ISOM number one, you see more of an oval shape. Uh, he's got more of a fuller face, and his cheekbones don't stand out anywhere near as prominently as they do on the Shane Davis cover. I almost wonder, just from the you know sense that I got looking at the Shane Davis cover, of whether he used Michael B. Jordan as a photo reference, because honestly, he is who came to mind when I saw uh, this version of Avery Sillman. And let me tell you, I would love it if Michael B. Jordan were to play Isom in a movie. I think he'd do a great job of that. Uh, I'd be thrilled to see that. But uh, in terms of his being a lookalike for Avery Sillman at this point, you know, when we're doing actual cover art and trying to make the art look like the character, uh, I'm going to have to deduct some points for accuracy on the face here. Going to the cover B by Ethan Van Skyver. This is the cover featuring Sidney Bloodruth, the uh, uh, witch of some sorts. Um, now, there are a few problems that I have with this cover. I'm probably going to speak on this cover the longest. The first of which, all of the, all of the problems occur within this portion of the frame. And the largest of which is the largeness of Avery Silman. Uh, Isom is big, but he's not that freaking big. If you look at his body shape as portrayed by Cliff Richards, he's not that big of a dude. Uh, he's more like, Schwar I would say he'd be more like Schwarzenegger towards the Terminator 2 phase as opposed to Schwarzenegger towards the Terminator 1 phase, which is where I'm seeing Avery Sullivan right here, especially with that big freaking roll of neck meat, which reminds me of <laughs> when Jim Shooter actually made Fun of characters like this in his book Shadow State. Broadway Comics was Jim Shooter's second attempt at, at putting together a comic book company after Valiant. Uh, he went from Valiant, got ejected from there, went to Defiant. Defiant got shut down due to a Marvel lawsuit, and then uh, he uh, did Broadway for a few months. And I loved the Broadway books, and this was a particularly funny uh Till Death Do Us Part was a particularly funny arc in which a guy who was a comic book fan and who loved comic books, the type of which Rob Liefeld used to do back in the day, wished to be a superhero in that model and became one in the real world. The only problem being is that Rob Liefeld doesn't know how to draw anatomy. <laughs> and so he wound up with this 
freakish anatomy, part of which involved having like a roll of neck muscle like we see on Avery Stoneman here. I mean, seriously, looking at uh, Isom, I felt like he's, you know, trapped in a meat suit. Uh, that That's just not the character's actual body shape. So I would tone down uh, Isom's body here to something a little bit more reasonable and resembling the uh, interior art that we've seen with uh, Isom number one. Now, the other problem that I have is that we have two characters who are looking incredibly bored. And I have a, I have a saying, if your characters look bored, I'm going to be bored. And it all goes back to when I used to watch a show back in the day called Nash Bridges. And this was featuring Don Johnson. You probably saw him last in Django Unchained. And this is and, uh, to his side is uh, Cheech Marin uh, of the famous duo Cheech and Chong. And there was a scene in there that I'll never forget. It was uh, a bomb scare, and Nash Bridges walks up. He's a detective working with the uh, San Francisco police force. He walks up to the bomb. He reads the card that's on the bomb. He crumples it up in anger, throws it away, and then he calmly walks away from the bomb, which is ticking down to zero. And I'm looking at this thinking, this is dull. There's no energy, there's no excitement in somebody walking away from an explosion. <laughs> you know, if you're walking away from an explosion, that means you think it's no threat. And if you think it's no threat, then I think it's no threat. What I'm seeing, and, and you know, I, I've also seen this of late in the show Ahsoka, when I, one of these, you know, dipsticks with a dual-bladed lightsaber throws it at her, and she does a backflip to evade its initial approach, but then it like a boomerang, it starts coming back around. And instead of doing another backflip or some sort of exciting maneuver, she just leans out of the way with an expression of nonchalance on her face. And it's dull. It like it drains the excitement right out of the scene because if she's not going to treat it like a serious threat, then why should I be excited by it? And that is the total vibe I get from the facial expressions on these characters. Uh, she's not; lo she's looking calm, cool, and collected. He's looking calm, cool, and collected, even when they're surrounded by these beast things. And, you know, if they don't care, why should I? I need to know that there's an actual threat to these characters so that I can become concerned for them. And so what I would do in order to fix this scene is first... I would give Blood Ruth more of a facial expression that expressed some sort of exertion, some sort of, you know, desperation, some sort of concern for her own safety. Give her something that shows us that, you know, this is not a safe situation that they're in. And as far as uh, Avery goes, one of the things I notice about that is that it looks like everybody's staring at the reader, including the beasts. I mean, I know they got eight eyes, so it's kind of hard to see in what direction they're looking at any given moment. But as far as everybody in there, their heads are either pointed at the camera or they're pointed at us. <coughs> and especially uh, uh, Blood Ruth and Avery. And I'm just like, guys, this is not a family photo. You know, not everybody's not. This is not like an older brother trolling a younger brother and giving him noogies while uh uh, you know, the, the, the mom's trying to get everybody to behave and snap a photo. Uh, this is a, supposed to be a chaotic scene. And one way to improve the chaos in this scene is to turn Avery's gaze toward the creatures on his right. These are about to swarm him and overwhelm him. Let him at least look at them and acknowledge them so that we know he's aware of the threat. And by him being aware of the threat, we become aware of the threat because right now he's just ignoring them and it looks like they're no threat at all. And that's just boring. So, you know, liven up these scenes. It's not enough to just have characters facing the camera stoically. You need to show some action and you need to show the characters concerned about their own well-being because if they're not concerned, we're not going to be. Last but not least, we've got cover A, also by Turnian. And uh, this one, I have no problem with the artwork. I did have a little bit of a time figuring out that that picture in the background on the right-hand side was an empty Isom costume, but I eventually figured it out. <coughs> um, but the one thing that I do have a problem with on this, I mean, the artwork is fine. Uh, find out. Why did Isom quit? That's fine. I love the retro look. This is this is by far my favorite cover. I love the the 
the retro going back to um, the old Marvel days, the kind of way that the, their uh, flashback campaign did back in the day. I love the Ripperverse symbol substituting for the Comics Code Authority. This is a great cover, but I don't like that box. That box down there featuring the first appearances of Sidney Bloodroot, Gooding, Chadron. Why don't I like that? Well, because there's a fourth character here. It's the one he's fighting. He's fighting somebody, and you've just mentioned that we're going to see three characters, but you haven't tied any of these names to that character that he's fighting, so I guess this is a fourth character who I guess is not important because even though he's on the character, you didn't decide to name him. Except, of course, you did. I mean, this is Chadron, whom he's fighting on the cover, but you will never know that looking at that box. So why is it that the box wasn't constructed in such a way to make Chadron known to the reader as the person that Isom is fighting? And before one of you freaking goalposts readers says, oh, you just want him to tell you everything, this is not a secret. He's been going around telling people that Isom is fighting Chadron on the cover of this book. I mean, Eric July has made no bones about the fact that this character is Chadron. He doesn't care that you know. He actually wants you to know. So if he wants you to know, why doesn't he communicate it on this cover? It wouldn't be hard to do. All you have to do is rejigger the words and give Chadron a, a, a different font for his name. So something like this. Introducing Sidney Bloodroot, Gooding, and the frightful fatal fury of Chadron. And then there's no question whatsoever that Chadron is the one on the cover because you've singled that name out among the three names that are being introduced. So, you know, it's easy to do. And one of the things that really bothers me is that Eric July still demonstrably does not have anybody in his circle who can give him this little bit of editorial advice, who can basically say, look, you know, this is great artwork, but your, your box needs a little bit of work. You know, you, you need to be able to, the, the reader should know that this is Chadron that he's fighting. How is it that when he's surrounded by people like Chuck Dixon, by, by uh, Joe Bennett, you know, these, these people who have been in the business for a while, who I assume have read comics for a while, how is it that you don't get that kind of input from anybody around you? I don't understand that. You need somebody who is an editor like that, and it makes me fearful for the quality that I'm going to see on the interior of the book. Uh, I, I'm really hoping that, you know, as a lot of people have been saying, they, they think that the uh, the writing quality is improved. They think that the, uh, the book quality is improved overall. It's like, okay, I hope that's true. But things like this do not make me hopeful because it means that, that that key input of a reader who can look at this with a critical eye and say, you know, I'd adjust this. This, this needs some tweaking is still not there. So we shall see. All right, quick recap. Cover D, smaller moon. We don't want the moon crashing into the earth. Cover C, uh, did I say cover C or cover D the last time? Anyway, read along and it's it's accurate. Cover C, more accurate face. Yeah, I mean, making him look like Michael B. Jordan is a great idea for recruiting him for ISOM, but it just doesn't look like the character right now. Cover B, few things, less bulky ISOM. Exciting facial expressions. If they're bored, we're bored. And turn Isom's head. You know, give us break up the sight lines so that we have a more chaotic scene. And then cover A, single out Chadron. I mean, he's on the cover. Single out his name. Thank you for watching. I'm Mike Partika. Please do subscribe so you will catch the next videos in my Let's Fix Isom number two series. I hope there aren't a lot of them because my goodness. <sighs> I had 13 on ISOM number one. If you didn't see those, go back and watch them. Although I will tell you, I will be doing another round of critique on ISOM number one. Once I have completed my critique of ISOM number two, I'll be looking at ISOM number one in light of ISOM number two and seeing if there's any fixes that need to be applied on account of the new information that's been introduced. And I'll also be able to show you a little bit more of what I've been seeing in, in, in trucks and stairs and other kinds of, you know, which word is italicized where. I'll be able to go through a lot of that and show you visually what it is I've been seeing, which I was not able to do before because I didn't have a copy that I could cannibalize for scan. I'm also hoping that, my goodness, that the binding on 
uh, ISOM number two is, as I think it's been reported, not as strong a binding as it was on ISOM number one. ISOM number one, the only way I was going to get good scans is if I tore that sucker apart. If the binding is not that strong on ISOM number two, then maybe I'll be able to get away with just bending it, you know, just bending it in the extreme and hoping that I can flatten it out. Otherwise, well, one of those things is going to be cannibalized and uh, guess which one? Guess which one, Ethan? <laughs> All right. Thank you for watching. I'm Mike Bartika. Appreciate your time and do subscribe so that you can get notified of later videos. I will talk to you later.